All right, guys, welcome back to the study of Leviticus. Here we are, Leviticus 6. Yes, we're plowing through a whole lot of offerings. At the end of, I guess yesterday, at the end of Leviticus 5, which we didn't talk about, but then going into the end of Leviticus 5 and the beginning of Leviticus 6, you see this trespass offering, or you see this guilt offering. It depends, again, who you're talking to. Now, now remember this, okay? You have a manual. <laughs> you have a manual that says, here is the guides for how I want you, remember, God tells Moses how I want you to engage with me and my presence. But in order to come to the table, literally, <laughs> you need to make sure you're giving up of yourselves for me to accept you. And so I need you to let go of these sins, sins, intentional and unintentional sins. Some of you are going to be called out by other people and some of you are going to just recognize you have sins, but you're going to come, you're going to give up the bull, you're going to give up the sheep and goats, you're going to give up the turtle doves, and then you're going to recognize that you need forgiveness. And it's only going to come through the atonement, yes, the atonement of that, that sacrifice. Now think about this, through the bowl, when you put your hands on there, you slaughter, you're killing it, you're skinning it, you're cutting it up, you're putting it on fire, you're burning it up. All of those things will lead to, yes, this blood bringing about forgiveness for your sins, for the Israelite sins. And so all of these offerings have tendencies to, yes, point to those things. And so when we're talking about sin, you got to understand Israel in this context, they've been in Egypt for a really long time. And now all of a sudden they're, they're wandering around in the wilderness, and this is really their, their only home base. And one of the commentators in Nelson's just says, Israel was a refuge, uh, a refugee nation. They, they didn't really have a home, and they're traveling throughout the desert. Now, whenever you have people that are traveling throughout the desert, you think vagabonds, you think Bedouins, and then you really think, no rules. <laughs> Wait, no shirt, no shoes? No rules! No, how's that go, Rich? Do you remember rule. that? There's one rule. There's one rule! <laughs> so, like, that, <laughs> that's kind of the mentality that the Israelites have. It's like, okay, so you're telling me, what can, I, what can I get away with? So you have theft, you have deception, you know, you have limited resources, dishonest people. And so you have these offerings to put things into place. Again, at the end of Leviticus 5, you see people uh, recognizing the knowledge. They're, they're sure that there's the knowledge of the guilt. They recognize, yep, I'm guilty. And then there are other times that there, maybe it's, it's suspected knowledge of guilt. Like, oh, maybe you are guilty. Maybe I am guilty. I don't know. You know, it's that kind of... How do they, how do they know? <laughs> like, are they going to point like something at Kyle? I know something about you. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of it. It's kind of weird. Maybe they went to the Urim and the Thunum. I just wanted to say it. So the UNT is in the house. All right, so. <laughs> All right, so let's jump in to a little bit of this guilt offering, okay, if we can. Leviticus 6, verse 1. Remember, this is the manual for these refugees. I don't know how else to describe it. They're, they're trying to find their home. They're trying to figure out where do we land this plane. And in this process of wandering, I need some help. And so the Lord spoke to Moses. This is kind of an ongoing conversation. He says in verse 2, when someone sins... And offends the Lord by deceiving his neighbor in regard to a deposit, a security or a robbery, or defrauds his neighbor, it continues to go on in verse 3, or finds something lost and then lies about it. Hey, did you happen to find my, uh, my scooter? Nope, sure didn't. That looks like my scooter. Nope, not yours. I mean, like, can you imagine the, wander the wilderness conversations? Like, hey, that's my rock. No, that's my rock. I mean, what are they going to argue over? <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is crazy. This is a true story. Uh, my dad's store got robbed and uh, we have cameras on it. We, we saw the guy, he, I mean, crazy, drilled a, I mean, ridiculous things, right? This, this robber comes in. Well, they've had more robberies, you guys, in Middlebury in these last couple months than they had in two years combined. And how about this one? The gas station owner, a family friend of ours, the guy, this is the second time he's robbed. The second time this guy comes in, he comes at him with a crowbar, the robber, and the guy behind the gas station pulls out his knife and stabs him. This is in Middlebury, Indiana. Now look, I'm not making light of this. The guy takes off, like this just happened. The guy takes off and they can't find him. There's no hospital, you know, like you'd go to hospitals, like, hey, did anybody get stabbed? That's probably it. Like we have multiple, like this is what's happening right now in Middlebury. <laughs> It's happening in Leviticus 6. Neighbors are getting weird. People are starting to say things. They're doing things. And so you got to start saying, okay, what do we need to do? 
So at the end of verse 3, or swears falsely about any of these sinful things a person may do. Now, just so you know, I'm totally not making light of what's taking place because it's really annoying when people break into your stuff. It's an, I mean, it's, it's not right. And if Kevin, if you go back to verse 2, when this happens, you offend the Lord. You offend the Lord when you break into Ace Hardware. You offend the Lord when you break into a gas station. I mean, that's how practical this is. You offend the Lord when you say you're defrauding your neighbor or you're keeping money, uh, you're deceiving them. It's crazy. And then in verse four, Kevin, if you'd go there, uh, once he has sinned and acknowledged his guilt. So then the, the challenge would be is to get this guy that robbed my dad's store. The challenge would be um, that he would acknowledge that he did it, his wrong. And then once he acknowledged that he's wrong, then he has to return all of the money. He has to return the things that he stole from the gas station. He has to return these things or the deposit that was given him or the lost item or the scooter that he found. <laughs> I don't know. Keep going into verse five or anything else about which he swore falsely. So the cool thing about this story is, is that God is giving somebody an outlet, right? To recognize, yes, I'm guilty, but I would like to make full restitution for it and add a fifth of its value to it. Okay, now this, this is kind of cool to me. What, what I'm seeing here is, is like, okay, let, let's come up with an item uh, in the hardware store that somebody would, that, that they would steal. Rich, what, what, what would this guy have stolen? Uh, sawzall. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, a sawzall. All right, well, let's go Milwaukee. Should we do a Milwaukee sawzall? Sure, that's a good brand. Do, do they sell Milwaukee in Ace Hardware? They used to. So we, we, have, a, we have a, okay, we have a Craftsman sawzall. The guy steals it. He's like, you're right, I'm so sorry. God, I've offended you, I've offended my neighbor. He then has to bring the sawzall back to my dad, right? And then it says, then what does he have to do? He's gotta add one fifth more to it. He has to add a fifth to it. He has to add 20%, right? 20, 40, 60, 80. Yeah, that's right. 20%, so then he says, here, sir, here's some more shekels. Here's some more dollars. I don't know what they would have paid in. Or blades. Or blades, but he's giving on top of what he's taken. He has to pay to it its owner on the day he acknowledges his guilt. So the day that he's like, you know, gosh, I really shouldn't have stolen from Ace or I really shouldn't have stolen those six packs of Gatorades from the, the gas station, right? Well, the second the scripture says you acknowledge that you're guilty, you have to take it back, give 20%. And like, this is the process. And so here's what you have is, is that you have this procedure that's taking place. You gotta understand, they don't have a whole lot of rules right now in place. You have a refugee nation that's wandering around. And so he says, okay, now I wanna tell you this, this is kinda cool, this happened to Zacchaeus. Okay, would you go to Z uh, Luke 19, verse eight. Zacchaeus, a wee little man, a wee little man was he, he climbed a tree, a sycamore tree, and that's all I know. Anybody else know the rest of the words? <laughs> so anyway, Zacchaeus, he stood there and he said to the Lord in Luke 19, verse eight, you're singing it in your head right now, I climbed a tree, and na 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 little man was he. And Zacchaeus, you come down from there. That's all I know, right? So and then look, he says, look, I'll give half of my possessions to the poor. Look, Lord, and I've ex extorted anything from, if I've extorted anything from anyone else, I'll pay back four times as much. This guy, when he was in the presence of the Lord, when he understood who Jesus was, he says, I, I, I'll give up half of my possessions. And then if I've done anything else, I'll pay you back four times as much. This is the same concept, is that Zacchaeus knows he's robbed people. He's a tax collector. He's a guy that's robbed people from his money. Same thing in Leviticus 6. When you've recognized you're guilty, at least give back the same thing plus 20%. Can you believe we're preaching on this, teaching on this? I, I think it's, it's kind of cool, though, because when you think about it, they didn't have any structure at that time. All they had known was slavery. All they had known was is that they were working for the Egyptians and they did what they were exactly what they were told to do. So if you would, Kevin, can you go back to, uh, in verse five, I just wanna just say one thing really quick. Uh, we all have opportunities in front of us to go the wrong way. You know, this guy realized, hey, I want a Sawzall. He didn't steal a Sawzall, but hey, I want a Sawzall. He could have chosen to not go that route. He could have chosen to not fall into the guilty category. And so just as an encouragement, look at the life of, you guys remember this, Joseph. If you go to Genesis 39, verse 9, here's a guy who could have fallen into sin, who could have gone against his neighbor, could have gone against his master, but he chose not to. He says, no one in this house, I'm in Genesis 39, 9. No one in this house is greater than I am. He has withheld nothing from me except you, 
He's talking about Potiphar's wife because you are his wife. So how could I do such a great evil and sin against God? At that point, if he would have fallen into sin, guess what? He would fall in. He would have had to offer in, in this context. You know, he would have had to offer some kind of an offering because of his sin. He would have been guilty, but he didn't do it. He didn't fall into this category. And I think to me, that's the challenge. That's a challenge. And so, Kevin, would you go to 1 John 4, verse 20? 1 John 4, verse 20. Just a cool image of, of what we're after. If anybody says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For the person who does not love his brother, he has not, he has seen, cannot love the God he has not seen. This image of, look, it's either one way or the other. And I love is that they're given these examples of how to do it the right way. But what you have in Leviticus 6 is in case you do it the wrong way, this is how we're going to correct. This is how you're going to see forgiveness take place. Now, just because you gave somebody back a sawzall and 20% doesn't mean you're forgiven. From the Lord, he says, there's more to it. So if you would go to verse 6. You see, once restitution, as Rooker says, once restitution has been made with man, it now needs to be sought with with the Lord. You know, it's really hard, you guys, to uh, come to the Lord and say, you know, I'm asking for forgiveness, but you know you haven't dealt with the family or you haven't dealt with the friends or you haven't dealt with the situations. It's like living two different lives. So that's why in verse six, once you've taken care of, right away you acknowledge that guilt. You take it to them, which I think, honestly, the American church has a ton to learn from just from this example. If you recognize you've done something guilty, go right to your brother and acknowledge it. And say, hey, I have brought harm to you. I have thought bad things about you. I've said something bad about you. Just go take care of it right away. In fact, in communion, isn't that what we're supposed to do? Before we take a part of, partake of the cup and partake of the bread, we are supposed to remember what he's done, but we're supposed to check our heart, examine our hearts, and then actually go and address this. I mean, how often do we ever really see that happen? You know, you see in communion, I don't, I don't see a whole lot of people getting up and saying, hey man, you know, I did this, this, and this. Like it, yeah, you might have to make a phone call, but the point is, is that we want to examine ourselves so that we can come to the table uh, guilty free. And the way that happens is he says in verse six, then he must bring his restitution offering to the Lord, an unblemished ram from the flock. Now, always now remember Scott Lane's image of an unblemished. Or what, what does an unblemished ram look like? A, what do you say? A crooked eye? A crooked eye. Yep. So there's no crooked eyes here. An unblemished ram from the flock, according to your assessment, this is cool, of its value as a restitution offering to the priest. So the priest, you ready for this? He now serves as an appraiser. He serves as an appraiser. Why? Because he says, you must bring an unblemished ram according to your assessment of the value of what took place with your neighbor. He says, oh, by the way, I'm going to serve as an appraiser to give you an appropriate value to the goods. And then at that point, then you bring this ram, unblemished ram to me. So not only are you giving up what you stole plus 20%, now you got to give up another animal. And you're like, oh man, I probably shouldn't have taken that sawzall in the first place. I'm telling you what, it never works out, you guys. But praise the Lord, God's giving an outlet for the Israelites. This is how you can be forgiven. In fact, it says in verse 7, in this way, the priest will make atonement. Remember, sacrifice, okay? You have the sacrifice, you have the imputation, and then you have death. Those components lead to atonement. In this way, the priest will make atonement on behalf before the Lord because of the unblemished ram, based on the value of what he took, and he will be forgiven because of the blood, right, for anything he may have done to incur guilt. Wow. That's a lot. All because one guy decided to steal something. But praise the Lord, amidst a world where it doesn't feel like there was rules in the wilderness, God says, I'm going to put some structure to this. And so that's the guilt offering. But then you can get into, we're going to start getting into what we would say the burnt offering. And so you have, just so you can see it visually on your screen, you have, you have the guilt offering. And now, again, we talked about this. Remember in, Gen, uh, in, Leviticus, in Leviticus 1, the burnt offering. And again, the Lord spoke to Moses. And he says, command Aaron and his sons, this is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering itself must remain on the altar's hearth all night until morning, while on the fire of the altar is kept burning on it. This is going to become a theme that we're going to talk about here in a little bit. This, this fire is constantly going. The priest then in verse 10 is to put on his linen robe and linen undergarments. 
He's to remove the ashes of the burnt offering. We know that's important. The fire is consumed on the altar, and then he places them beside the altar. There's a lot there. Remember, the priests have been anointed to do this work. This is their role. And then in verse 11, it says, Then he must take off his garments, put on other clothes, and bring the ashes outside the camp to a ceremonial clean place. This sounds familiar, guys, right? When the high priest or all of the congregation, you're supposed to take the burnt offering out. And so you're supposed to bring the ashes outside the camp. It's a powerful picture of what, what we see with Christ. And then it says in verse 12, you ready for this? The fire on the altar is to be kept burning. It must not go out. The fire mustn't go out. Every morning the priest will burn wood on the fire. And so, hey, let's come on over here to the tabernacle. And so you're going to walk in and then here, this fire can never go out. It says every morning the priest will burn wood on the fire. He's to arrange the burnt offering on the fire, burn the fat portions from the fellowship offerings, the peace sacrifices that we'll get into a little bit later. But this fire, the priest, every morning, every night. It's like, hey, Kevin, when we come in the studio, can you make sure that it's heated in here? <laughs> it's as close as we got. I mean, Kevin's the priest of this place back here, right? Keep things warm. Don't let the... It, well, Kevin, it was really cold last week. <laughs> were not allowed, they were not allowed to let the fire go out. In fact, five times, just in this paragraph, it says, the fire on the altar is keep, keep it burning. I mean, I just, I just, to me, you guys, this gets me, when I think of revival, when I think of my walk with the Lord, I just, I picture fire. In fact, the Time Revive logo is, is a flame, and that flame, to me, represents the Holy Spirit. And so, I just kind of want to walk through just this fire image. In Leviticus 9, fire came from the Lord, it consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell face down on the ground. The fire came from the Lord. I, I, that sounds really weird. Like we're asking for fire, but that fire can only come from him. Okay, so just I want to paint a picture here. The fire is also, as one commentator says, it's a perpetual fire that symbolizes perpetual worship. Like if you have the fire here, this fire is implying there's ongoing worship. It, it's not stopping morning and afternoon. The priests are keeping the fire going. So it's just a, a good image. And then really, it, it's another picture of a continual need. So the fire comes down. It's an ongoing uh, perpetual worship. And then it's this ongoing need for atonement, and reconciliation. So this fire represents atonement, reconciliation, worship, and the presence of God. And then when I think about this fire, I think, well, gosh, how, how does that apply to me? Because I want to be known as the guy where the fire just never goes out. And so you say, well, what is that fire as new believers? You know, here's the fire for the worship that keeps up going, that takes you before the throne. But what does that look like for new believers in the new covenant? Well, I'd like for you, if you would, go to Luke 3.16. And to me, this is the best illustration uh, that just speaks to my life. Maybe not yours, but it says, John answered them all. He says, he's John the Baptist. He says, I baptize you with water, but the one who's coming, who is more powerful than I, I'm not worthy to untie the strap of his sandals. Jesus, I'm not worthy to untie the strap of Jesus' sandals. He will baptize you. Okay, this is really cool. With the Holy Spirit and with fire. You know, when you accept Christ, you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And then what John the Baptist says, forget the charismatic stuff, forget the conservative stuff. John the Baptist says, Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with the fire. That's not weird. That's actually what Jesus, uh, what John says is going to happen. And so as you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, I believe that there are gifts inside of every single one of us. And I believe that when the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes, I believe those gifts begin to become expressed. They manifest themselves so that he gets the glory. But the way that the baptism of the Holy Spirit expresses itself, yes, through the gifts, is you've got to have the fire of God. And what I love about this image is this fire, this fire is burning away the chaff. This fire is burning away the guilt that's inside of you. This fire is burning away the sin that's inside of you. Constantly, we need the baptism of fire to take place because every day I struggle with something. Every day there's something. Holy Spirit, I need you to continue to keep this fire going inside of me. Burn away this chaff. Why? So that the Holy Spirit can express himself in my life with the gifts. The more that I'm bogged down with this sin and this guilt and whatever other, uh, other things you want to talk about, other, other issues, when the baptism of the fire takes off, I'm telling you guys, 
people will know that you are worshiping him, that you're ongoing worshiping him, that you're ongoing saying, I recognize I have been atoned for by what Christ has done in my life. But I think half the time the American church doesn't want to let the, the baptism of fire burn the junk off in our life. I think we'd rather sweep it under the rug in our lives and not talk about it. But I'm telling you, when that fire takes place, there's, there's freedom. There's freedom when the fire of God takes off in our lives. And then what happens is Romans 12, 1 and 2 really begins to take off. This baptism, the fire begins to take off. And then we begin to live our life like the Apostle Paul says. He says, by the mercies of God, brothers, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Imagine now this living sacrifice that's ongoing. You're, you're becoming a living sacrifice because the fire of God's inside of you. And this is your spiritual worship. This is pleasing to God. And then in verse 2, he says, so don't be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that I, and let me just say this, so that you can fight the world, that you can fight the flesh, that you can fight Satan, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. But if you never let the baptism of the fire, that I believe is an incredible picture here in the tabernacle, I'm telling you, you will drown in your sin. And what the atonement has done for you, yeah, you can say you've been set free, but you walk around like a depressed person that's never been changed by Christ. The baptism of the fire allows us to function in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then what happens is, is the words of, as Taylor was helping me find this verse, Jeremiah 20, verse 9. Jeremiah 20, verse 9, when you have and function by this ongoing morning and night fire that's inside of you, the prophet says, if I say I won't mention him or speak any longer in his name, his message becomes a fire burning in my heart, shut up in my bones. I become tired of holding it in and I cannot prevail. I'm telling you when the fire of God is no longer just at, at, a, at a burnt offering, but he's inside a burnt altar, but he's inside of you. I'm telling you, you can't stop talking about him. You know how to radically change your family, your community? You let the fire of God take over. Quit trying to figure out what it's going to look like. You know, the Lord's taking me to town tonight and tomorrow. I don't know what it's going to look like. And I, I'm, I, honestly, I, I need the Lord's strength in this. I need the Lord to burn away this weariness, this tiredness, so that he can express himself in my life. Psalm 39, verse 3. If you'd go there, the psalmist writes this. Psalm 39, verse 3. Talking about this fire, my heart grew hot within me. As I mused, a fire burned. I spoke with my tongue. I'm telling you, when we function like the fire, we begin to replicate this fire at the burnt offering that never goes out. You know, the, when people get burnt out in ministry, in church, in life, the only thing I can conclude, and I'll tell you, it, I've had seasons in my life where I've wanted to hang up. So I'm talking to myself from learning experiences. It's when I do it on my own strength and I don't let the fire of God take over. It's when I don't let the Holy Spirit take over and I try to figure it out myself. I try to do it in my own strength. It, it doesn't work. But when you let the fire of God go, I'm telling you guys, you can't contain it. And that's when I see verse 12 of Leviticus 6. I see priests morning and, and night arranging the burnt offering on the fire and they're burning the fat portions. It doesn't say night. It just says every morning. I'm burning the fat portions from the fellowship offerings on it. And then it's pretty cool because then in verse 13, the fire must be kept burning on the altar continually. It must not go out. Who would have thought that talking about <laughs> offerings, I mean, crazy burnt offerings would lead to, in my opinion, a message about revival. This is what we need. We need to come to the table saying, Lord, please forgive me of this. I acknowledge my guilt. I'm going to take care of it with my friend. I'm going to take care of it with my family. And now I'm asking for your forgiveness because when that happens, the fire, the fire doesn't go out. In fact, John MacArthur says it's always burning this mentality. It indicates a continuous readiness on part of God to receive confession and restitution through the sacrifice. God is saying on the fire side, yep, I want to keep receiving. I want to keep hearing what you have. And I, I love this image of the guilt offering, the burnt offering. And then what you have in verse uh, 14 Again, poor grain offering, it gets shafted every time. <laughs> Which is the cereal offering and the meal offering. Rich really likes this one. What did you say, honey nut, honey nut Cheerios? Uh, all the way 14 through 23, we, we talk about this daily grain offering. 
uh, that is presented and the, the high priest gets involved. And then in verse 24, again, uh, because of time, I just want to make sure you guys see, again, he talks about the sin offering. And so in verse 24, the Lord spoke to Moses and he says, tell Aaron and his sons, this is the law of the sin offering. And so again, he goes through this, this level and this process of all of these, these offerings. You know, there's a lot here all the way through 30. And then actually, um, we're only covering, praise the Lord, Leviticus 6 today. <laughs> I was thinking we got to cover another one. I want to wrap all of this up because I think here's what happens when, when we talk about, I want to just focus in on the, on the guilt offering for a second, okay? We've talked a little bit more about the burnt and the sin, not so much on the grain. But, but I think here's what happens. I think when we acknowledge the guilt that we've done something wrong, for some reason we allow Satan or the flesh or the world to creep in and we keep that guilt, like we hold on to that guilt. I, I don't understand. Like the atonement sets us free. The blood gives us life in what he's done. And so it's a weird, a weird picture of like Jesus has set us free. But yet what we do is, is we, we actually think, I believe the American church even thinks at times we're hypocrites. We carry on this, this double life. One commentator says, uh, Stephen Cole, he also says, I believe that the, the Satan loves to come in and he charges us with being guilty. And then he says, you always fall short. And then we stay in that position of, of a victim and that we've fallen short. And so we, even though we can offer our guilt offering to Jesus, it's like we hold on to it. We like to hold on to the, this message. And the devil is the one who throws things against you. In fact, in Re, uh, Revelation 12, 10, it says he's the accuser of the brethren. He loves to accuse us. He loves to come at us. He loves to come right at us and say, you did wrong. You messed up. And in fact, Kevin, can you go to Zechariah 3.1? I mean, this happened to Joshua. Satan was trying in Zechariah 3.1. Uh, Satan was, look, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord with Sa Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. I'm telling you guys, like just because we've done something wrong, we live in this position of, of not forgiving ourselves and we hold on to this guilt. But Jesus says, I have come to set you free. He's already taken care of it. You got to actually believe that the cross was actually for a reason. Because if you hold on to this sin, if you hold on to this guilt, you're saying, Jesus, it wasn't worth it for me. And what I love, at least with the Israelites, they're like, here you go. Here's an animal I'm getting rid of my guilt. <laughs> and I would love for all of us just to close with this if we can. I don't want us to live in this false guilt. I don't want to live in this callous, uh, heavy, thick hearted mindset. I'd rather us to uh, function in a spirit of freedom. And so, Kevin, can you go to 2 Corinthians 3, 17? 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And so you guys, when we talk about being baptized in the Spirit and in fire, you're saying, ultimately, I'm functioning in freedom. I got nothing to hide. I got no more junk. I want to function in freedom. And these guilt offerings in Leviticus 6, they bring freedom. And I'm telling you guys, but they had to do it every single time. You only have to do it once. Jesus, forgive me of this stuff and may I begin to walk in freedom. There's a lot here with Leviticus 6 and my prayer is you'll continue to, to dig in. There's multiple verses that talk about the freedom of the Lord. And my challenge is, is that you, you continue to find that freedom. Bless you guys, and we'll talk to Leviticus 7 uh, and on tomorrow. Thanks.